Good morning, everyone. This is Dan Holloway. I uh, want to welcome everyone to Sustainable Capital Finance's latest webinar, The Top Markets for CNI Solar for the Balance of 2021 and 2022. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Dan Holloway. I head up our origination and acquisitions team here at SCF. Uh, I, along with my colleague Joel Binstock, will be reviewing what we believe uh, to be the most promising solar and solar plus storage markets from now to the end of next year. So let's get into it. Uh, first off, uh, since we have quite a few new attendees today, which is great, uh, we will do a quick overview of SCF, uh, who we are, the types of financing we offer, a little bit about our primary funding partner, Nextera Energy. Uh, then we'll be covering some general industry trends that we see emerging in the CNI space and how we feel those trends will be impacting the CNI market. Uh, next, we'll move into some of the individual states themselves to kind of review the local conditions on the ground and what we believe uh, will have some significant impacts on each market. We'll be covering some of the challenges we run into and in what we think of as the underserved states where solar kind of struggles to find traction. Uh, we're going to give some thoughts as to where we believe the market's going from a technological point of view in 2022 and in the near term future. And then lastly, we're going to wrap up with a quick overview of SCF's simplified PPA process. So just so you can see how we've reduced the overall complexity as well as how we shorten the, the timeline uh, to push a PPA through the process. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box and we'll do our best to answer all of those uh, at the end during a Q&A session. So uh, SCF is a third party financier, which is kind of a fancy way of saying we provide power purchase agreements to the commercial and industrial, nonprofit, governmental and small utility scale markets. We support solar, solar plus storage, and we're in the process of launching a funding mechanism for fast EV chargers as well. So please keep an eye out for more information on this rapidly developing marketplace. Uh, SCF works primarily with EPCs and developers to provide PPA financing for their solar and solar plus storage projects. We provide construction financing as well as takeout financing. So we are a one-stop shop. Uh, the majority of our projects, probably around 70% of our business comes from nonprofit off takers that typically cannot monetize the federal tax credit and the remainder of our business comes from you know, typical commercial entities. We have transacted over 150 million in projects to date. And as I stated earlier, our primary funding partner we work with for these, pro these types of projects is Nextera Energy, which is the largest independent power producer in the world. Uh, Nextera currently owns more than 20 gigawatts, and that's with a G, uh, of solar and wind assets and has a market cap of approximately $150 billion. So now let's get into some general industry trends here. And we're gonna start that off with uh, material pricing and lead times. And I'm sure it's, it's really no surprise to any of you that material costs have been heading north uh, for a number of months due to both shortages and commodity costs rising pretty significantly. While modules and inverters uh, have not seen as large a bump in pricing, we have seen that racking and carports have increased by as much as 50% or more. Um, in addition, we're seeing anything made from steel go out in lead time from four to six months, in some cases even longer. And this is really pushing out construction time frames. So this is something all of us are going to have to manage in terms of timelines and keeping customer expectations in line with uh, the, the rea reality on the ground. On the technological front, there's a number of technological shifts that we see uh, that are underway in the CNI world. Energy storage solutions are a good example of this. Uh, battery solutions that were once what I think of uh, as the realm of, you know, like science experiments have gone much more mainstream uh, recently. In particular regions like California, where demand costs have absolutely skyrocketed in recent years, storage has become a necessity in some of these markets. And we believe this is only going to expand going forward as utilities continue to modify the rate structures to, meet, to be more demand driven. Uh, in SCE territory in Southern California, as an example, we're seeing that adding storage to solar is increasingly, or is, excuse me, is increasing the avoided cost by as much as uh, four to five cents per kilowatt hour. And this is pretty significant. Uh, storage is no longer kind of a nice to have, but is increasingly becoming what we think of as a need to have uh, in, in many areas. 
Another uh, pretty hot topic out there right now is electrical vehicle. Yeah, try that again. <laughs> electrical vehicle charging. Well, there are tens of thousands of level two chargers in the market. There's really only a few thousand fast chargers out there. And to put this into perspective, a level two charger can charge your car typically in about six to eight hours, while the new fast chargers can complete the same task in, let's say, 30 minutes or less, uh, depending on the, the rating of the charger itself. And this is gonna be an absolute game changer in the EV market. And one thing to note here, the expectation for the number of fast chargers needed by 2030 to support future EV sales is in the 8 to 10 million unit range. And that's an incredible amount of new EV fast chargers that, that are going to need to be installed in the next 10 years. Uh, and these are not inexpensive. Uh, current fast chargers are going for about 30000 apiece. Uh, and installed, they can be north of 50,000. So we think this is gonna be a very lucrative market for those that get involved early. On the module front, uh, bifacial modules are another technology that's getting a lot of traction in the CNI world. Bifacials have come down significantly in cost over the past five years and are very close, I would say, to parity with standard modules. Uh, however, depending on the type of mounting, and what lies beneath the bifacials, the production can be increased by typically four to eight percent, in some cases more. So they are quickly becoming uh, pretty popular with uh, our installers. And then lastly, trackers, specifically single axis trackers, are also another area we're seeing uh, with the majority of our larger ground mounted systems as they add significant production while adding uh, pretty minimal costs. So let's move on to some of the legisl yeah, legislation we see on the horizon. First obvious area to look at is the 2023 federal ITC step down. The step down will be a bit more gradual for commercial uh, than residential, but it will still impact our market pretty significantly, barring any changes from Congress. Uh, we believe there's a, a pretty good chance that with you know, Democratic Congress, Senate, and, and President, that the ITC could get extended or possibly even increased back to its original 30% level. But it's not something we can rely upon given the unrest in our, in our government. So uh, I think the idea of pushing to get as many projects built or contracted by the end of 2022 needs to remain a, a pretty high priority for all of us. In addition, we have things like the NEM 3.0 program, which is currently being negotiated in California, uh, which will have very, a, a very significant effect on our marketplace here, but we'll be covering this a little later. Uh, there's also a general shift in legislation across the country, and specifically in many of the more popular solar states uh, for energy bills to move from, to a more demand-driven electrical billing uh, which tends to hurt solar, but it also tends to help storage. So this is worth keeping an eye on in your specific region. Uh, there's some new construction mandates that are coming down uh, in some of the more progressive states as well, like California and Massachusetts. These mandates require solar on all new single family residences, so it doesn't really affect us, uh, but they also have some mandates uh, pertaining to new commercial buildings that are three stories or less uh, will also require solar. And we're, we're seeing that other states are, are kind of watching that and taking notice. So we think this may uh, spread to a certain extent going forward. Uh, community solar, which has been you know, a very hot topic for the last several years, uh, is also spreading with states like Florida and Minnesota recently enacting their own programs. And we expect this trend will continue uh, moving forward. And then lastly, structured incentive programs like the Illinois Adjustable Program and the recently enacted New Jersey SUSE program have recently either added significant amounts of new capital uh, or have provided just a more stable long-term incentive structure uh, that's much simpler for companies like SCF to finance. So uh, the incentive structures are becoming more, I would say, uh, designed to support the financing side of the, of the market. So, you know, there's a, a lot of areas we could cover in terms of emerging trends, but we felt these were kind of the most impactful to the majority of the customers that we serve. Uh, so now we're gonna get into some of the individual states and see where each of those are going. So for California, you know, we're seeing the California solar market is shifting pretty significantly and on a number of different fronts. Uh, the biggest and I would say scariest issue uh, that we see is the adoption of the new NEM 3.0 tariffs. 
Uh, NEM, for those of you who aren't aware, stands for net energy metering. And these version 3.0 tariffs uh, are being negotiated as we speak. We're expecting them to get ratified and announced uh, sometime in Q1 of next year. And there are three groups that have provided proposals for what the new NEM 3.0 pricing should look like. Uh, those groups are CALSA, uh, which is a solar industry, kind of solar friendly, consumer driven group. There's CAISO, the California ISO, uh, and the utilities themselves. And each have their own justifications and competing rationales for their own individual plans. But based on everything we've read, and the webinars we've attended, here's kind of what we expect to happen. So first off, energy exported to the grid is going to be dropping, uh, we think, pretty substantially in value. Uh, we don't know by how much yet, but we do know that the residential side will most likely get hit harder than commercial, as residential has really been uh, the bigger benefactor, financially speaking, based on, on previous rate structures. Uh, the reason for the proposed NEM 3.0 change is that there's there's just simply too much solar being generated in the middle of the day that can't be used at that time. And it's actually kind of expensive for the utilities to manage this energy and trying to figure out how to store it for later use when it can be used. So we feel that this is most likely going to lead to smaller solar systems that have limited export potential becoming kind of much more the, the norm in our industry. Much like the way Hawaii has approached the solar market, they've gone to a zero energy export standard. Uh, California, while not quite as draconian, looks to reduce the value of exported energy to something much closer to wholesale rates uh, as a way of disincentivizing people from building larger systems that would export you know, a lot of energy in the middle of the day when it's not needed. Uh, we're also seeing the, the prognosticators uh, predict that storage is as a, as a function of this will become significantly more valuable going forward uh, for all the same reasons. So we expect the storage market to continue to expand pretty rapidly here and in, in some of the other states as well. Um, lastly, as we've touched on, we believe the residential side is gonna most likely take the brunt uh, of, of this new uh, rate change as they've really become one of the more expensive solar markets for the utility side to support. Um, another area we've, we've touched on briefly is energy storage. This is going to be an important part of the overall renewable energy puzzle going forward. So if you haven't gotten on board the storage bus yet, um, we think that now is definitely the time. Uh, CCAs, or Community Choice Aggregators, uh, we're seeing these to continue to pop up across the state. CCAs are basically community-run utilities that build their own energy producing facilities. Uh, typically solar, uh, and then they, they lease distribution lines uh, from the local utilities, and the goal being to provide uh, lower cost energy to their community members. And SCF has the ability to receive payments from CCAs, much like feed and tariff programs, and we can provide annual uh, either land lease or roof lease payments to property owners. Uh, so if you come across these and want to bid on them, this is something we can definitely support. Uh, lastly, we touched on California's recently passed new Assembly Bill 178, which mandates solar for all new single-family residences and multifamily residences uh, up to three stories in height, uh, which, which we've already mentioned, so it's something to be aware of. And, you know, just as a summation, overall, we believe California is going to continue to be the leading market for solar in the country, but we also believe that the proportion of the components used are most likely going to shift once the NEM 3.0 rules take, take place. We're gonna see uh, smaller solar systems and, and larger storage systems. So just the mix of, of the different assets is going to change, we feel, going forward. So let's move on to Arizona. Um, you know, one of the surprising things a lot of people don't know about Arizona, it is the fifth largest state when it comes to installed solar capacity, um, to be fair, I was not aware of this either until I put the slide together. So I just found that kind of interesting. Arizona, as we know, gets a, a ton of sunshine. Uh, that is for sure. But the relatively low cost of electricity in Arizona has really been the issue, I think, for solar installers. And, and what we've seen in response is that many of the EPCs in Arizona have become, uh, we think, very good at installing solar at you know pretty inexpensive prices. Uh, and as energy prices have continued to rise over time and the cost of installation has continued to, to decrease over time, these two curves are, have really finally become 
began to intersect and we're seeing solar begin to accelerate as a function of that. So while it's still not a slam dunk uh, in the state, it's becoming a, a very significant state in terms of solar for the CNI market. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Arizona has not adopted community solar yet, uh, and much of the solar that is installed there is, is more on the utility scale side, but we are seeing the CNI uh, side really start to pick up. So, uh, you know, power prices have escalated recently with the largest electricity provider, Arizona Public Service Company, or uh, APS, has recently been approved for a 6% rate hike starting in April, and we expect this to these types of rates to continue to uh, to move forward, you know, at this this higher clip. So if you're in this market already or looking for areas to expand, we believe this will be a very solid market going forward. So with that, I'm going to hand the reins off to my colleague Joel and let him take it from here. Joel, thanks, Dan. Really appreciate that. Um, so as Dan mentioned, I'm going to be talking about. A Illinois. So firstly, sorry to my Bears fans in the audience. But on the bright side, back in September, Governor Pritzker signed the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. And by signing this act, Illinois is committing to massively growing renewable energy generation in the state, and specifically phasing out fossil fuel generation entirely by 2045. Uh, they're also looking to expand economic opportunities for disadvantaged and low income communities, and much, much more. Personally, growing up in Ohio, this is really big news as Illinois is the first Midwestern state to require a carbon-free power sector. Some of the funding will be dedicated to reopening the Adjustable Block Rec Program, which will reopen on the 15th of December this year. And I recommend following updates on IllinoisShines.com, who is the program administrator for the Adjustable Block Program. In addition, more funding will be made available for Illinois Solar for All program, helping to fund renewable energy generation opportunities for low-income residents, communities of color, and other disadvantaged communities. Needless to say, Illinois is going to have a very exciting 2022 and beyond for solar and other renewables, and SCF is really, really excited to be participating in that process. Moving on to another state with some really exciting incentive programs, we have New Jersey. So New Jersey has had a legacy REC program since 2018 through the Clean Energy Act. And that legacy program has closed in April, 2020. And then the TRC established this transi transition REC program, also known as the T-REC, which kicked off in May, 2020 and was available through much of 2021. And SEF had a lot of success funding projects through the T-REC program. Now the Successor Solar Incentive Program, or SUSI for short, is replacing the TREC program to support over 3,700 megawatts of new solar generation. And this program has quite attractive REC values that you can see here over on the chart to the right. Uh, with additional SREC adders of $20 per megawatt hour eligible for public entities who are already great candidates for PPAs. One thing to note as well is these RECs are secured for 15 years at that REC rate. It makes it really strong investment grade revenue for financiers such as sustainable capital finance to participate so we're very excited for uh the the, the SUSE program to be following up the t-rec program and this is a program that a lot of uh states have taken uh same with the adjustable block program and the smart program coming out of massachusetts where recs are not being speculative they're actually being locked into specific rates over a given term and that makes it a lot more bankable for for, like I said, for financiers such as us. So now that we have broken down some of the best states for commercial scale solar development in 2022 and beyond, let's identify the challenges for underserved markets, starting with the challenges that are actually actionable. So legislation is critical when discussing what markets are economically viable. In certain markets like Florida or North Carolina, the third party sale of power is actually prohibitive and thus third party financiers such as sustainable capital finance are unable to serve those markets. Beyond prohibition, there, are, there can be solar taxes or pilots which stand for payments in lieu of taxes or other transactional costs that can make solar more costly to deploy. Lastly, when discussing legislation, there are incentive programs that we discussed in the previous slides. These incentive programs are brought on through the passing of bills at the state level, 
and can help bring more economic viability to otherwise difficult solar economics. So next is the cost of power, which goes hand in hand with solar incentive programs. In states like Illinois and New Jersey, which I just mentioned, where the cost of power is relatively low, the incentive programs help improve the economic viability of solar deployment at a residential, commercial, and even small scale utility uh, levels. So if you are developing solar in a state with low cost of power and minimal local incentives, solar financiers such as SCF are often unable to provide power purchase agreements that can generate even minimal savings for our customers, particularly if the cost of local labor is also high. Separate from energy charges are demand and time of use charges, which are proliferating across utilities and states, as they've learned from California. These different charges can limit the maximum savings that solar can have on a customer's bill. So if these charges are high, one option is to consider integrating energy storage. Otherwise, the customer may not see the savings on their electricity bill with the utility that they were anticipating when going solar. Lastly, a challenge that we have minimal control over are solar production factors like soiling, snow, and rainfall, as well as general solar irradiance. While soiling can be addressed by washing down arrays on occasion, in certain areas, soiling may limit solar production substantially and hurt project economics. Think desert climates. Bakersfield, California comes to mind when I've looked at a lot of production. In addition, in states where there is substantial snowfall in the winter that develops into snowpack, for example, in Colorado, where I currently live, this can lead to weeks of minimal or even zero solar production. Lastly, general solar irradiance has a massive impact on solar economics. An example would be comparing Vermont and Arizona. So Arizona has a sun index of 1.18, whereas Vermont has a sun index closer to 0.77. That means the same solar installation in both of these states yields significantly different generation. And for power purchase agreements where every single kilowatt hour is purchased by the customer at a pre-specified rate, this can lead to varying economic viability between the states. Now let's talk about what's next in 2022 and beyond, starting with a topic that we have mentioned several times throughout the presentation, and that's integrating energy storage. Integrating energy storage can be a tremendous way to add value to a commercial scale solar install. And by integrating energy storage, you can mitigate some demand charges that standalone solar is unable to reduce. In addition, you can maximize the value of both assets by charging the batteries with affordable solar energy and then dispatching the energy storage system when demand spikes or if there are demand response programs that the systems can be enrolled in. And so by adding energy storage, these assets become a lot more flexible and resilient specifically to future changes in utility rate structuring, which we are seeing in California and other states. So it really helps to bring a lot more resiliency uh, to these assets. As Dan mentioned earlier when discussing technologies, we are seeing a tremendous uptick in demand for fast EV chargers across the country. Particularly with the flagship car manufacturers like Ford establishing EV mandates, the volume of EVs on the road is anticipated to balloon over the next decade, and the infrastructure needed to support EVs is nowhere where it needs to be. So that is where SCF's EV charging solutions can come in. We can provide property owners with revenue share programs to install fast chargers on properties, particularly those that are high value for EV traffic. Think about located near highways or in retail centers. And by integrating solar and energy storage with fast chargers, we can mitigate spikes in demand from the charging and utilize affordable solar energy to power the upcoming wave of electric vehicles on our road. So now that we've covered the top markets, technologies, and plans for the future, uh, because we have so many new attendees here, I wanted to take a quick step back and explain how SCF efficiently finances so many renewable projects. And that is through our eight-step simplified process, starting with indicative modeling through SCF's online cloud-based platform, the SCF Suite, and our Quick Quote Calculator. PPA quotes can be modeled in as little as 30 seconds, and once a viable quote is calculated, you can create a project to provide additional info for proposal generation and project submission. 
All that info collected is very straightforward and should take no longer than 10 minutes. Afterwards, a project can be submitted for review by SCF's evaluation team, and a term sheet can be issued in as little as 72 hours. After a term sheet is issued, or even if it's executed, a kickoff call is often set up so that SCF's project analyst team can answer any questions that the customer has regarding the PPA terms, PPA process, and next steps. And it also helps to build rapport with the customer. And so once a term sheet is executed, SCF's project operations team begins their diligence, which typically takes 30 days while a PPA is issued to the customer for a legal review and execution. And then the EPC agreement, engineering procurement and construction agreement is issued to the installer. This process outlines how simple it is to get a customer under contract in as little as 30 days, giving ample time for project diligence while keeping the customer engaged and excited throughout the process, which we all know is critical to converting on these types of projects. So now that I've shown you our simplified process, you may be asking how to register uh, for the SCF suite. Well, that can be completed via the SCF suite registration link, which I've provided here on the right. On the left is our integrator survey. If you're looking to just set up an introductory call with one of our team members, uh, it's just a helpful way to, to, to get educated and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, once again, there's on the SCF suite has no subscription fees and you can have multiple users for your company's account. So feel free to register, get activated. We can set up a demo for you with one of our project analysts. Uh, so with that, now let's go ahead and jump into our q and I've seen some questions come in and I'm going to leave this slide up so that you could obtain either Dan or my contact info and feel free to reach out uh, via our numbers or our email addresses and we'll get back to you. And like I mentioned, we will have a recording available uh, either later today or first thing tomorrow that if you request it, we'll absolutely send it your way. So with that, let me just open up this questions and uh, I will delegate to Dan and myself as, as we come through. Can you please address your thoughts on the future of the Texas market? Thank you, that's a really good question. So Texas is a deregulated market, which traditionally has made it a challenge for third-party financiers such as SCF to participate in because the cost of power is so low, right? In a lot of areas, it can be as low as five cents, but I'm seeing in certain areas, particularly in the urban areas, that, that rate is climbing higher up to 10 cents, maybe even a little higher. And that's where uh, PPAs are going to be effective. Uh, and typically at scale. So if you're able to identify customers that need 500 kilowatts or one megawatt or even larger uh, systems to address their consumption needs, that's where we're gonna benefit. And if there's opportunities to do single access trackers, as Dan mentioned earlier, to really boost that production um, while limiting the kind of increase in costs, that's gonna help increase the, those asset values and make it so that PPAs can be competitive with the deregulated market. Traditionally, those PPAs will be 25 years, maybe we'll go up to 30 years in order to make a project more economically viable for the customer. But that's, a, that's kind of a general assessment of Texas market. And we do see quite a few projects come in through Texas. Uh, ultimately, the smaller projects are much more difficult to pencil because economies of scale and, and equipment procurement and labor costs really limit our abilities to offer PPAs that generate substantial savings for our customers. There was also another Texas question uh, in terms of grid design at the PUC level. Uh, I'll have to get back to you, Robert, on that in terms of uh, how they're structuring in terms of either regulating or changing their regulations and legislation in Texas. Uh, but it is going to be, typically when we look at states and markets, we look at it from a state level and then on the utility level, what are the restrictions, added transactional costs when tying into that specific utility? Um, and is, or is there an option that they might even be prohibitive to, to, to net meter in that particular utility? So uh, it would really be on a case by case basis for, for this, a market like Texas, particularly as it has been deregulated um, up to date with a lot of utilities. And so happy to work with you specifically on any sort of projects um, and we can work through those uh, on a state level and utility level. 
Dan, would you like to take a question? Sure. Um, let's see, there was a question regarding Arizona and whether PPAs were allowed there. Uh, technically, they are not. Um, and the way we've kind of gotten around that is through a different uh, agreement called a Solar Services Agreement or an SSA. Uh, essentially, it's, it's somewhat of a semantic discussion, but uh, there's a way to define what we're selling in terms of kilowatt hours as a service rather than an actual energy unit. And we have gotten this blessed um, by, by legal on both sides. So uh, there is a path to making uh, SSAs work within that state. Thanks, Dan. Uh, um, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so in terms of, I, I saw a question with regards to, are there areas where you can trade the energy storage into the grid? I think what you mean is essentially dispatching energy storage. One thing to note when we're talking about commercial CNI uh, development of solar and solar plus storage assets is these storage assets are typically no greater than two megawatt hours, usually a, either one megawatt, two hour battery, or maybe it's a four hour battery at 500 kilowatts. And ultimately there are programs, particularly in California and Southern California Edison, where resource adequacy and, and capacity can be sold into the grid at a specific predefined rate. And those can be very, very attractive. And we'll see other markets take that exact approach where it's a resource adequacy program or a capacity payment program or some sort of demand response program, which I mentioned earlier, where these storage assets can be enrolled in uh, as well as these solar assets in terms of mitigating on-site demand uh, spikes uh, and ensuring a demand response payments by the utility. So absolutely something that can happen. And, and one thing to note as well is for energy storage in the commercial space, typically you wanna make sure that you're cycling the battery as efficiently as possible so that you are not jeopardizing the ITC credit that you're able to take for energy storage that means you have to charge the battery significantly, typically 75% to 100% from the solar installation. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you're not increasing the degradation rate of that battery by cycling it for non-advantageous programs. So one of one key uh, strategy is to use energy arbitrage, where in time of use periods, you can load shift and help maximize the value of the storage asset, but it really has to be economically viable and we typically use one of our partners, Energy Toolbase, to assess the economic viability of those types of programs uh, to determine can the energy storage be cycled at uh, the right frequency in order to be accretive in terms of the overall savings for the customer. Dan, did you see the question with regards to net metering 2.0 and grandfathering? I did. Um, so the question was, can you explain how the NEM 2.0 uh, current tariff structure can be grandfathered. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a hard and fast rule here, but the, the guidance we've been giving our uh, customers is essentially as long as you reach interconnect prior to the end of this year, I think you have a, a fairly uh, good leg to stand on in terms of uh, being safe. Uh, there is there haven't been rules announced yet as to when the NEM 3.0 uh, tariffs are officially going to be enacted. Uh, so they haven't really backed into what the final date will be for the NEM 2.0 cutoff, but we're using the end of the year as kind of our guideline, our uh, yardstick, if you will, for when projects need to have uh, interconnect approval. Thanks for that, Dan. Here on uh, Delaware and Pennsylvania. Um, we don't see a ton of projects coming from Delaware currently, so I don't have a good uh, opinion on that. Maybe Joel can share something. On Pennsylvania, um, another kind of challenging market in terms of solar, just because uh, the uh, avoided cost of energy in that state tends to be on the lower side. Uh, however, I, we have heard rumblings uh, from some of our developers there that uh, they are looking at something like the New Jersey uh, REC program uh, is a way to uh, accelerate the adoption of solar in that state. Uh, it's only been rumblings though. We have, we've seen no, uh, no articles, no papers on it yet, but uh, we know it's being discussed internally there. So just in general terms, uh, PA is 
you know, an obvious state for solar. They've got uh, they've got reasonable insulation rates, uh, and it seems like uh, it, it should be a good state for solar uh, once they have some sort of incentive structure that makes it make sense there. Joel, you have anything on Delaware? Yeah. So in terms, I saw another question with regards to net metering credits for low-income community solar subscribers in Delaware. So one thing is we typically like to utilize our partners that are boots on the ground in those states to, to kind of have an ear to the ground on what, what's going on on the policy side. We do regularly check in uh, through the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to assess any sort of changes in the policies uh, and incentive structures for independent states. And so in terms of anticipating uh, the net metering credit, I, I don't want to kind of speak out of the side of my mouth for that, but uh, essentially as soon as that credit is written into uh, kind of utility policy, that's kind of when we utilize it, particularly upload it to our quick quote platform so that it can be modeled correctly. And I did see um, another question, particularly on community solar, uh, where is essentially how a community solar program is typically structured because the where the, the system is installed the customer is not to the, the property owner is not directly getting energy credits from net metering unless they are an anchor tenant they are often paid through a, a site lease agreement typically that's a per acre annual payment with an annual lease escalator and that can be modeled in the SCF suite and our valuation team is very comfortable modeling lease rates. Uh, they can vary across different states, particularly based off of the incentives uh, incorporated with those community solar programs and also the cost for asset management, which is one of those costs that sometimes isn't um, kind of modeled in ahead of time when you're talking about subscribership management as well as acquisition. So that, uh, in terms of uh, we would come in exclusively for owning the project and we will come in for the full capital stack. So that means the debt so equity side, tax equity, uh, the 100% of the capital stack. We do not provide any sort of uh, sale lease back model uh, for those or just an equity cap, a tax equity capital play. Um, in terms, I saw another question with New Jersey. Uh, have we seen any solar plus energy storage facilities under PPA structures in New Jersey? Uh, that's a great question. So we have not actually seen any energy storage be integrated into proposals for New Jersey under the TREC program or SUSE. Well, SUSE is not essentially unlocked yet, but uh, we do we we have heard that energy storage is increasingly becoming uh, a topic of conversation, particularly on the legislative side. Uh, in New Jersey. And so if there's going to be programs, demand response for programs, uh, capacity payment programs, uh, those would be ways to add additional creative value towards energy storage assets. Right now, I'd still believe that because of SUSE and, and the TREC programs being so attractive on the REC value side, energy storage should be able to be incorporated. But ultimately, what does that impact the total project economics? and would the customer be better off going solar standalone? So that's an option that we can, and we can present both options to a customer. So we can do solar standalone, as well as solar plus storage using all the local incentives. And that way the customer can see, essentially, you know, with an increased cost of a total uh, solar plus storage asset, what would be the expected PPA payments? But we absolutely support solar plus storage PPAs. We do not structure a side lease payment for the energy storage. What's the outlook on Nevada? That's a great question. So Nevada has been up and down over the, you know, ever since probably 2012, uh, really with solar development. It's clearly a, a market that has really strong sun to next and, and solar irradiance, as well as a pretty established uh, labor force. And so we do believe that Nevada has some upside, particularly in 2022 and beyond. However, uh, because of the legislative past, Oftentimes, financiers are a little skeptical to go into Nevada when policies can change and dictate uh, net metering uh, credits that are associated with solar uh, so drastically, um, so quickly. And that's what happened a few years ago and really scared a lot of the financiers out of that space. Hopefully, going forward, when they see that you know they're not meeting their RPS standards and they're trying to develop and procure more uh, renewable generation, solar is definitely going to be 
a low hanging fruit and it should be able to be economically viable based off of the avoided cost and the solar irradiance and cost of labor. What about Maryland? I just saw that question come through. Uh, so Maryland has a rec market. It is a speculative rec market, and that can be very challenging, not only for third-party financiers like SEF, but generally just to value, properly value a project because ultimately that, that rec value can go up or down over the, the course of the, the operating history of that, of that installation. And thus, we typically like to kind of model a forward uh, sale contract, typically three year or five year, just to see what's kind of bankable uh, in those particular markets. But Maryland is definitely a, a market we're seeing more projects in. Uh, it's unfortunate they do not have a rec program like New Jersey, where it's uh, 15 year fixed, because those are considered investment grade revenue streams. Uh, whereas uh, speculative rec markets definitely have to take a little bit of a uh, kind of a hurdle uh, increase in order to, to be economically viable. Hey Joel, I have a couple of questions I was going to jump in on here. Sure. Uh, there was a question about what credit strength uh, do we look for um, for PPA off takers? Is, is it investment grade only? Uh, you know, the easy answer to that would be yes, investment grade only. Uh, the more nuanced answer to that is that. Uh, for borderline cases, uh, we have done, uh, in some cases, a, a deeper dive on the credit side uh, and been able to find out there's something going on with the, the entity that is temporal in nature and will probably uh, resolve at some point. And for those uh, or other areas where there may be some credit mitigation uh, devices we can use, in some cases, we've been able to make that work. But in general, uh, what we look for is uh, investment grade. And if they don't have a public credit rating, um, we can take the most previous two years of audited financials and run those through kind of a shadow rating that we do on our side to determine if they are uh, investment grade or not. So it's a really good question. Um, there was also a question here about indexed rates. Uh, and I think the question's pertaining to, can we tie a PPA rate to the underlying local uh, tariff rate? And as it changes over time, the PPA rate would change accordingly. Um, we have struggled to make those work uh, in the past. Nextera Energy is a very conservative company. Uh, and because they're our primary funding source, uh, it, their, their take on it is paramount here. And their view on it is, you know, in the, the unlikely event that rates were to go down over time, they would not be receiving a guaranteed return. So not only are they taking risk on the production side they're taking risk on the credit side now they would be taking risk on the underlying rate side as well and when you add all that up it's just it's it's a lot of risk for them to adopt for the the types of returns that they're getting so in general we steer away from those as much as possible some multiple questions with regards to georgia uh, in terms of we are starting to see projects um, I don't know if Dan can speak a little bit to it more. Uh, in terms of hist historically, the challenge has been always the cost of power uh, as well as the cost of labor tied into can we generate enough savings to make it compelling? I do anticipate going forward, Georgia is going to be uh, a pretty attractive market. The one thing to note is that it has to be utility reviewed. So we're gonna make sure that when we're looking at a Georgia project, what are the utility restrictions and transactional cost assumptions that might be incurred, like a pilot that I mentioned earlier, or any sort of energy sales tax? Uh, because a lot of, uh, you know, the traditional solar states have uh, essentially tax exemptions on solar, whereas a lot of these newer states to the market are trying to explore ways to potentially make solar a little bit more difficult to, to, to be energized in their state. Uh, as well as uh, particularly with third-party financing and the third-party sale of power. So absolutely interested in Georgia. And Dan, do you have anything else on Georgia? No, I think that's a pretty good assessment. Okay. Um, Vir does Virginia have a rec? Uh, I believe they do not, to the best of my knowledge, uh, and I don't believe they're one of the states that are able to sell into other markets like DC, which has an extremely attractive rec market. Um, but it's always something that is is constantly changing, and we do have a kind of a markets team that is constantly trying to update our quick quote calculator with the best available recs and incentive structures. So I uh, always recommend checking out our quick quote calculator that should reflect the most up-to-date 
uh, programs. And like I mentioned earlier, we really trust on our partners to, to bring us intel on what they're seeing on the legislative level at, at you know in their own states. And so if there is uh, an update that came around the corner uh, you know, a few weeks ago or a few weeks in the future, it's always helpful to hear from you and, and get access to that documentation, update our quick quote calculator, uh, work with Nextera to make sure we can underwrite those types of assets and, and move forward and jump into those programs. The Build Back Better bill, sorry, that's a little bit of a word twister, uh, may include increased tax equity percentages for labor and low income. Will SCF's financing reflect those advantages? Absolutely. Any sort of legislative uh, documentation uh, that is written in will absolutely utilize to, to, make, to make additional value for these solar assets. So particularly with low income, low income is often tied to incentive programs, like I mentioned, the Solar for All program, which exists in Illinois, but other markets as well definitely can be um, definitely can be a, a way for us to tap into those incentives and and we'll see as as that national legislation gets written in how does it kind of trickle down into the state level uh, as well as the um, is on the utility level as well um, I'll just answer two questions really quick um, so North Carolina unfortunately uh, under Duke territory the third party sale of power is not authorized now there are opportunities to work with the Rural Electric Municipal Co-ops or REMCs in order to sign PPAs with them. Similar to our community choice aggregators here in California, those Rural Electric Municipal Co-ops do have the ability to sign up for PPAs. They are typically very low rates. And so it's gonna be a challenge in, in North Carolina, but as it stands under Duke territory, uh, the third party sale of power is not authorized and thus we will not be able to support uh, projects in North Carolina. And then in terms of the projects that we prefer in the DC area, uh, mentioning 250 kilowatts, really as big as you can get it in DC, the better, but you know, it's very hard to find a, two, a rooftop that can support more than 250 kilowatts. So if you can find uh, opportunities in, in DC for systems greater than 250 kilowatts, it's a very attractive market. So even though it is a speculative rec market, it's a very, very attractive rec value. Um, it's just kind of the limit in space that typically we're seeing with DC systems tending to be a little bit smaller. Um, and, and I kind of answered two questions with that on the DC side. And then in general for system sizes and our minimum system size that we're willing to support, typically 250 kilowatts is kind of that, that bottom threshold uh, for projects that we're willing to support. Um, Ideally, if it's a customer, it's a single entity, let's say a school district, uh, where the elementary school might only need 50 kilowatts, but the middle school and high school have another 300 or 400 kilowatts, we absolutely want to aggregate them in order to, to, to maximize the value of the project and also really the tr maximize the value of savings that we are contributing. Because as a PPA provider, ultimately what we sell to a customer is no capital outlay, so they're not gonna pay anything for the install, uh, the, the asset management, the insurance uh, for the system. What they're benefiting from is, is savings. So that is our that is our shtick. That's what we try to sell to our customers. And the more kilowatts that we can install for a customer, typically offsetting 90% of historical consumption, uh, that's what we wanna size the system appropriately at. I saw a really creative question uh, Thank you. So some projects in the Maryland tie in the Pepco DC grid and therefore would possibly be eligible for DC recs. Would we consider those types of projects? Absolutely. If you're able to obtain DC recs over Maryland recs, you would do that 100 times out of 100. Uh, it's just a much more attractive incentive structure. Uh, and it's just really important to, to always think about how to be as, as creative as possible when you're talking about stacking incentives. And then can you finance a roof replacement or other building work at the site onto, into the PPA rate? So yes, the, the short answer is yes, it, but it's a little bit more nuanced. Uh, I always like to disclose, A, the ITC eligibility basis will always take a hit as you add non-eligible build costs into the PPA. And then secondly, and, and what I think oftentimes uh, is misunderstood and mischaracterized, is we own the solar asset, but we do not own the rooftop. So any sort of uh, roof 
uh, replacement work that we put into uh, into the project, uh, we are essentially utilizing and we're increasing the PPA rate, which is which is realistically increasing the PPA default risk rate. And by doing so, in the event that there was a default, we have no recourse on the roof, just on the solar installation. And so that's why it's always a double-edged sword when you're talking about, you know, this, the rooftop is old and it needs to be uh, fixed up in order to support uh, a solar installation, but we don't own that asset. And so it's really, uh, we work with our operations team and our underwriting team to make sure that we're not essentially over levering into the roof. And so there there could be limits to the amount of, of roof work that we're willing to support, particularly depending on the PPA rate, the avoided cost and uh, the credit strength of the customer. Dan, any questions? The only thing I would add to that is that kind of goes for any assets that aren't necessarily solar related. Um, one of the common questions we'll get for uh, carports is can we put LED lighting underneath it and can we support that? Kind of a, a general guideline to follow is, you know, if it's not more than, you know, whatever this thing that we're adding is not more than about 10% of the build cost of the solar or the solar plus storage, um, we can take a look at it and see if we can uh, push that into the price. It's probably not going to affect the PPA rate dramatically. And so in that sense, uh, we've been able to get okay with that in, in some cases. But it's it's very much a case-by-case -case, uh, question. So this has been really, really great. We really appreciate it. We're just running up to our time limit right now. Um, so... On behalf of Dan and myself, we really want to thank you for taking the time. For all the other questions that, that have been asked, we always add them to our FAQ section on the SCF suite. So as I mentioned, feel free to register for the SCF suite or email myself or Dan if you have any questions that you'd like specifically answered. We're happy to get on a call or correspond via email, whichever works best for you guys. But uh, Dan, anything you'd like to add before we jump off? No, I'd just like to say thank you, everyone, for your time. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share some of our insights that, we, that we've received over the last uh, six, seven months. So, um, yeah, appreciate it, everyone uh, jumping on. Thank you very much, everyone. You guys have a great rest of your week.